Good morning and welcome to Politico Live. My name is Hector Hernandez Morales and I'm a reporter on Politico Europe's Energy and Climate Desk, where I cover renewable energy and electricity markets, among other topics. It's precisely that subject that we'll be delving into today at this session, focusing in on Europe's energy price surge. This morning, European citizens are once again waking up to shockingly high power prices. In France, the price of electricity is averaging 299 euros per megawatt hour today, while in Italy, consumers face 290 euro megawatt hour averages, and in the Iberian Peninsula, the average hovers around 226 euros. Those truly remarkable prices have left consumers across the block raging and political leaders scrambling to address the issue. But what's behind it all? Is it a flawed energy market system, lack of preparation for the green transition? Russian interference? We'll be looking at all the possible explanations and their ultimate implications for the EU's energy and climate policies during this morning's debate. Uh, before we get to that, however, we're going to cover some, house uh, some uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, so uh, we'd like to make this event as interactive as possible, and uh, we'd like you to be part of it. And if you'd like to, you can participate by tweeting at, about it, at Political Live, and ask questions via the Slido app using hashtag EU. That's hashtag energy price EU. Uh, we'll be prioritizing questions which are sent with a name and organization uh, clearly listed. So uh, please feel free to do that and uh, and take part in this exciting chat. Uh, you can already share your thoughts and answer the following poll question, which is being presented by Enel. And that question is, what is the most effective action the European Commission can take to tackle the current energy price surge? We'll look back at the results at the end of our panel discussion. Now, before we get started, we'll hear some opening remarks from Enel, and uh, specifically from Simone Mori, Enel's head of Europe. Yes. Many, many thanks, many thanks to Politico for having organized this event today. That's very timely, actually, if you consider the big discussion that took place yesterday in the European Council about, about energy prices. So the question is very broad, and I will let the panel to discuss it, but I think the reason for the, uh, having this conversation today is not, uh, is not to to analyze, to make a diagnosis, to analyze the, the, the cause of the root causes of what is happening. There are probably a combination of supply side causes, demand side causes. But at the end of the day, if you want, the volatility is an inherent part of the, of the gas business. The problem is at the end of the day that uh, Europe, large economy, large perimeter, large geography is just depending too much uh, from gas. We know that, we know the story. And this is a, uh, why, uh, after you know, first a first phase in which the the debate was a quite chaotic on the topic, it seems very clear now that the energy transition is not part of the problem. It's basically uh, the uh, major, the main uh, uh, structural solution. Uh, we have the commission today. We have another the commission today with us. And let me mention what uh, what President von der Leyen say during the Sustainable Energy Week, every kilowatt hour of electricity produced with renewable energy is not only an insurance against rising energy prices, it also helps us to reduce our dependence on imports, making our economy more resilient and our planet a healthier place. I mean, that's very, you know, very clear, very straightforward. So going to the to the, to the the title of the, the, the debate today, what, what European energy price, what it means and what, what might be, be done, uh, we believe that the direction is a proper one, it's the right one. Direction means you Green Deal implementing uh, uh, the ta decarbonization targets, utilizing uh, the two uh, pillars which today are uh, ready, are mature, are economically efficient, so which are basically uh, renewables in order to produce, you know, uh, let's say domestic uh, uh, and clean electricity and energy efficiency, mainly through the electrification, because utilizing this uh, uh, cheap and uh, clean uh, electricity uh, as much as possible is, is the best way to combine uh, uh, decarbonization and efficiency and, uh, uh, and the reduction of, of import uh, dependency. Uh, we, uh, we are supporting 100% what the commission is trying to do. Uh, and uh, the problem is to accelerate. We have the targets, we have the policies, we have to accelerate implementation. So there is a big problem of permitting, and that's probably what the, the major, the major uh, constraint today preventing the, the short-term and mid-term achievement of the targets. So the, this is a problem that should be faced at domestic level, at member state level, but we believe that a stronger push from the commission may help 
in order to overcome all the, the problems that are administrative, but we have red tape that account member states are facing in order to allocate all these investments. Uh, there is also a problem of, uh, of immediate measures, of course. Uh, we believe that uh, something has to be done selectively. Uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the problem of high prices are not impacting every, everybody and all the, all the companies, all the customers in the same way. Let's consider that, uh, that uh, many, for example, many customers are already covered by long-term contracts and that they have a quite stable sort of situation. Uh, we, uh, we believe that what the European Commission did with, with, uh, with the famous uh, uh, toolbox was very smart. The risk here is uh, to have, you know, an heterogeneous, an heterogeneous uh, uh, manifestation of panic among the member states bringing the result to undermining the market, fragmenting uh, European uh, unified energy market, and bringing to short-term solution that could be very negative in the mid to long term. So the position of Europe, that we have to keep going on the tracks we are following, we relying on the, again, on the major pillars of the strategy, which is decarbonizing, uh, and uh, our our economy, and uh, keep going with a market which has to be based in competition, uh, is uh, the most important point. This doesn't mean that that the market could not be uh, modified. Uh, it probably some fine tune may be useful, but not because of we need to react to the short term problems coming to gas volatility, but because we believe that some fine tuning to the market tools could help to go in the direction that the European Commission showed in its uh, toolbox, which basically helping the, the investments in decarbonized technology uh, or through the um, long-term stabilization of prices. So uh, thank you very much. I stay in the five minutes you gave me. Uh, thank you again. I'm really looking forward to hear from your words what you think about this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simone. Uh, and now it's time for our panel discussion. So it's my pleasure this morning to uh, welcome our panelists. Uh, we will begin with uh, Dries Ake, Director of Energy Systems for the European Climate Foundation. Good morning. Uh, Monique Goyens, Director General of the European Consumer Organization. Good morning, Monique. Christian Ruby, Secretary General of Euroelectric. Good morning, Christian. And Mechtil Wolfstodfer. Deputy Director General at the European Commission's uh, DG Enner. So, uh, Mechthild, let's start with you and a very basic question. How long do you expect uh, that European consumers will be facing these soaring prices? First of all, thanks for inviting me and good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I must say, listening to Simone Mori, uh, I can agree to a lot what he has been saying, both on the courses as well as, as short-term versus medium to long-term solutions, which we have indeed uh, presented from the Commission side in the toolbox, which was adopted uh, on the 13th of October. Um, I think we, we still are very much concerned in the Commission about these high prices, even though volatile prices have been existing and will continue to be volatile uh, electricity and gas prices in the future. But we, we are very much concerned because it affects both households and industry. And I'm sure we will hear more uh, in the debate. Um, I won't add anything to the courses, but if you ask me for how long it will be lasting, this is very difficult to say. Mm. Uh, our own assessment is that this high price, which we are seeing now and probably through the month of winter, and then it depends also uh, on the uh, sort of winter we will have, a mild winter, a cold winter, a very cold winter, the scenarios are, are there. But we still expect, and I think that is an agreement with many um, other uh, outside um, organizations, we accept the prices to stabilize in March, April next year, maybe at a high level, but not at this very high level. And there are a few reasons for that, because one of the causes of, of the high prices right now is linked to the strong recovery after uh, the COVID pandemic. Now we live again in a very uncertain uh, time regarding COVID, but 
it has been showing that demand has been rising everywhere. And it's not only a European problem, Asia and others. So demand and supply are the causes of, of, of this uh, spark of prices. So we expect it to uh, that demand will uh, normalize and, and supply will catch up. So the prices by April, March will uh, stabilize a bit further and uh, at, at a high level, but not at a, high, a very high level. So as far as we can see now, uh, and then obviously our main role is to look at the short term solution, but very much so on the medium and long term, uh, because that so that we are better prepared uh, if if that continues or another of this high price spike uh, will appear. Uh, Mexico, you, yeah. yeah, well, I, I I actually wanted to follow up on that. So you mentioned the uh, the commission's toolbox, which is this communication that was brought out with existing policy options that countries can already put in place to address this crisis. As you're well aware, some member countries, amongst them Spain, Italy, uh, Greece, I believe, uh, France now, have been suggesting that a uh, that deeper changes need to be made, uh, and some of them have been, been calling for uh, fundamental changes to the bloc's wholesale electricity market structure. Uh, now. For the, for the viewers who aren't familiar with it, the way that the structure works, it's a marginal system. And, uh, and to give it a comparison, it's, uh, it works so that the uh, most expensive power in the mix basically sets the, the price for all of it. Uh, the comparison that I've, that I've heard in Spain, which I thought was a, quite a clever one, is that uh, it says if uh, you go to the supermarket and you go to the, 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 the butcher and you, uh, you ask for some ham and you ask for some cheap sausages and then just a little bit of filet mignon and yet everything is charged at that filet mignon price. And, uh, and that's one of, the, one of the main things that, for example, Madrid has been most insisting on saying that they, they think this is unfair. Uh, there's the counter argument to that, which is that this system has been made precisely to 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 allow for the development, especially of renewable energy and, and, and other energy sources. But before we get into all of that, I do want to to just ask you directly, uh, the commission's position has been that big changes should not be made to the market, that this is the best possible market we have. In fact, we heard Commissioner Simpson say that yesterday at the meeting of the of the um, energy ministers. Mechtild, is, is that the case? Is it is it not necessary to make any any major changes as, as some of these countries are asking for? So first of all, in the toolbox, we very much say we have to look on the functioning of the market and we have tasked ACER, uh, the regulatory body from uh, Ljubljana, to make uh, an assessment on how the electricity market works and the preliminary result were presented yesterday. And that's pretty much in line what Commissioner Simpson said, that we strongly believe that the electricity market, how it is uh, constructed over many, many years uh, is working rather well. We have uh, uh, competitive markets and we have uh, electricity prices, which are rewarding, as you said, investments in renewable, which are the future. And I think everyone agrees on that. So uh, what we will do, and that was also confirmed yesterday, we, will, we have been asking Acer to look in more depth, if anything, could be fine-tuned, could be done for consumers, could be done in the future, and that will come out in April. But this is not uh, um, questioning how the, the system works right now. Uh, as, as you said, we strongly believe that this is uh, an electricity market design which works well, but we are open to look uh, at the possibilities, and there were a few uh, suggestions yesterday <laughs> in the Council how to do it. And just to come back, we had indeed a debate and we had two position papers from two group of countries. Mm -hmm. um, one was uh, Spain, France, Romania, Greece, and I think Czech Republic, Italy. Um, five countries, uh, Czech Republic joined in the debate, but five countries uh, had a so-called non-paper and made suggestions how to improve the situation. On the other side, we had nine other member states, uh, Luxembourg, Germany, Denmark, uh, Estonia and others, who said they are very, very happy how the market is functioning, in particular the electricity market design. So just to put the, the whole thing in a, in a, in a perspective, uh, we are strongly believing that uh, the market design has delivered and will deliver, but we are open to look at some issues of fine tuning and looking at consumer and maybe also uh, how it is applied at national level, which uh, is one of the reasons why the debate is so different, because Spain has uh, some different rules than, for example, Germany or other countries mm. uh, when it comes to long-term 
contracts or how, how the price spike is translated directly to consumer or not. Thank you. Are you are you uh, just one last thing before we turn to the rest of the panel? Are you are you surprised by the by the by the calls for reform? I suppose that last year when prices were at an all time low, nobody was asking to change the market structure, right? I mean, that's in the nature. I mean, we have done an assessment, uh, and for ten years, uh, the current market design has delivered really competitive lower prices. Nobody complained. And now, if we have the price spikes, obviously, uh, it's another situation. But as I said. We are listening to it. We have read carefully uh, the, the non-papers and we, we have been discussing yesterday for some hours um, what can be done. And ASA will publish the study in April and we will consult all the stakeholders, industry, member states, academia, consumers, NGOs, uh, what could be the best way. But the fundamentals are well discovered, uh, well covered in the market design. And as I think everyone agrees we need to accelerate renewables. We need to make sure investments in green energy transition or clean energy transition is happening. And that can only be done if we have incentives. But uh, Mexil, be, be, just just one last thing. And, and as uh, Simone said in his opening remarks, and as Acer wrote in in their in their preliminary uh, version of this report, which the, the final version, of course, we're expecting in April, fine tuning is possible. The, there could be tweaks to the to the system. Yeah, we are looking at, at uh, what the member states suggested, and we are open for any fine-tuning uh, which might be necessary. Mm. But first, uh, I think it's better to assess and yeah, wait, wait what the study right. will say. Uh, Christian, I saw your hand shoot up, so uh, why, don't we, why don't we turn to you? And I'm, I'm also curious to hear your thoughts on this, and in particular, if you have any thoughts as to those possible uh, tweaks that could be made. Is there, is there, are there any areas that you in particular think uh, could be improved upon? Well, let me start by picking up on, on the on the image of, of uh, ham in the supermarket. I think that is slightly misleading for two reasons. First of all, we're not going to be able to power our iPhones and keep the lights on with ham. Uh, <laughs> secondly, um, the supermarket is retail, and what we're discussing here is a wholesale market. So we have a very different commodity and a different market level, and, and, and therefore we should not draw those comparisons because we're basically getting the wrong kind of discussion. So, so what is the wholesale market? It sounds, you know, to, to normal people a bit sort of obscure and strange. It's basically a market that's designed for uh, deciding what big machines to that are going to provide electricity to consumers the next day. And of course, you want to make sure that that market basically uses the cheapest machines first. So the ones that are able to provide the cheapest price in the market. They're the ones that are chosen first. That's also why that on a good day with a lot of wind, a lot of solar, energy is almost free because that doesn't cost anything for the next marginal hour. And so that's all those free hours you were talking about uh, that we had last year. In fact, we had 1,800 instances of negative prices last year because we had a lot of renewable capacity. So. That's an important place to start the discussion to get those uh, fundamental concepts right. Now, could there be tweaks to this market? I think there are two aspects to cover here. First of all, tweaks to a market that basically decides the investment framework and the investment incentives for the most important sector of the energy transition. Tweaks to such a market should not be made overnight they should not be made in individual capitals decided by the ministry, by royal decree, something cooked up late evening in a corridor. That needs to follow a very clear analytical process, a very transparent stakeholder involvement process, and a clear legislative process at EU level. So that's on the process side. Otherwise, this will be poison for investors, and we're going to derail the energy transition if every government starts panicking and putting weird stuff in place. And we're seeing the consequences of that in Spain, in the Czech Republic, uh, in Romania currently. So um, we have to be really careful. Now to the second part, is there something that we could do? I think there's something to discuss. Let's be honest about that. Mm -hmm. As I said, this market that we have is intended to decide on a dispatch decision tomorrow. Now, we know that we're facing some extremely big uh, investment decisions that are of a 
20 year nature, 30 year nature, we need to build out storage massively. We need to have power plants for the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years to basically support the renewables. We need to build out renewables in unprecedented amounts. Do we have the long-term signals for that? Does the market provide those long-term signals? I think that's a question. A second question that I think is really interesting is the, um, the issue of localization. We know that the energy transition is about more local technologies. Electric cars are being connected to the distribution grids. Heat pumps are being connected to the distribution grids. Renewables are connected to the distribution grids far away from the transmission level where the current wholesale market is operating. Now, can we handle all that activity two voltage levels away from where the activity is going on in the future? I think there is a discussion to be had about local flexibility markets. Mm -hmm. And I think that discussion is a constructive one to have. So we are open to discuss what we do not want is panic that undermines investor confidence, panic that kills the energy transition, panic that ultimately punishes the consumer because with more uh, and unregulated, you know, unregulated uh, interventions, we're also going to see higher prices. I, I you know, I, I, I fully see your point there. But what do you say to the governments that are actually dealing with panicked civilians with the with the what would you say to the to the to the Spanish minister of the ecological transition is Teresa Rivera who's dealing with Spanish consumers who are now dealing with these these crazy bills and to be to be fair the problem in Spain I, I believe started more or, or was more acutely noted than in the rest of Europe uh, already since May they've been they've been dealing with unusually high bills during the summer that kept growing and and now it's it's just absolutely mad so uh, the central government there is under extreme pressure Obviously, they're seeking to, to, to respond to consumers. What would you tell them in terms of how to communicate this to them? Because obviously, up here in Brussels and as a, as a, as a technical exercise, I'm sure we can all come to that agreement. But when, when, you know, when, the, when, when we actually have to deal with this on the ground, what would you encourage ministers to, to do in that sense? I would say the same things, and I have said the same things to Teresa Ribera um, publicly and and on conferences and the like, uh, in letters. Um, so we've uh, we've been very vocal about our concerns over the panic solutions of the Spanish government, and that discussion is not over. Let's be clear about that. Um, we should never respond to a new situation with panic. We should go with pragmatism, and and let's be clear. Uh, it's very. Um, timely for governments to do something, but there is a very clear, uh, let's say, set of rules they should stay within, and the commission has set that out with the toolbox. There's a lot that governments can do. Let's be clear about the fact that if you have rising prices, you also have rising tax revenues. Now, why don't you spend that money on the most vulnerable customers? Because actually there is more money to spend. The second thing we need to look at here is how big of a crisis is this? I think we should talk about a surge, not a crisis, because what are we talking about? My bill has increased uh, on a monthly basis in Belgium by 50 euros. That's a lot of money. But let's be clear, most families with two incomes can actually square a temporary increase of that nature. In other countries, the increase is even less, maybe 15 euros, 20 euros. So let's focus on those for, for whom that kind of amount is a lot of money, an elderly, maybe a student or someone who's a single. Those people may need help and we should target our efforts as a society towards those and make sure that they don't, uh, let's say, suffer unnecessarily from this. And then we should do what we need to do, which is build out renewables as fast as we can, implement energy efficiency measures so that we also, in a structural level, reduce the prices for consumers. I, I want to turn to to Monique as the as the as the voice of the consumers on this uh, on this panel, and kind of following up on what we were touching on already with with Christian. So, again, going back to the Spanish example because it it seems to work very well as just one of the more one of the more particular cases uh, in 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 this scenario. We're talking about a country that right now is generating around eighty five percent of its power from from renewables. Uh, with the rising prices, uh, one of the things that the the Ministry of Ecological Transition has pointed out there is is uh, the, the difficulty that they're having now turning to consumers who are complaining to them, who are saying, you know, we thought the green transition, we thought the switch to renewables would actually lower prices. Instead, we 
we're dealing with these bills. What's the fundamental communication problem that's happening here, and how much damage is that doing to consumers' views of the of the Green Deal? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for having invited me to provide uh, the consumer perspective uh, to this debate. I, I wanted to start with an maybe inaccurate um, reaction to your filet mignon syndrome. <laughs> as a uh, because if you really are afraid of having to uh, face the filet mignon price surges, uh, then become a vegetarian. And that's <laughs> a little bit what I wanted to say also uh, when, uh, you know, uh, the, the solution will be with renewables. Get away from fossil fuels. That would be the, the, the as quickly as possible. That would be the um, uh, the, the the response. And now, but, but hold on, question. Monique, because be, be, before we 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 go on to that, and, and in response to that, we all agree. I, I think everyone on the panel agrees that that renewables will be good for for the for the price surge ultimately. But the reality of the market is that until we can cover 100 percent of demand with renewables, we're still going to be exposed to those fossil fuels. And to my knowledge, there's no European country that's even close to that right now. In fact, we're not expecting that until at least 2030, right? Indeed, there is transitional measures have to be have to be taken, and I totally agree with what Christian just said. Short-term measures have to be taken, and certainly in Spain, uh, to to uh, for example, uh, to to give tax reductions, certainly to the less uh, affluent one. It's not only the elderly and the students; it's overall uh, low-income consumers, where the energy bill is um, is a high part of their budget, disproportionate high part of the budget, and it's also uh, about banning this connection, so so that people feel safe, even if they can, if they struggle. Uh, with the energy bill, certainly during the winter. There is also one very important thing that needs to be done, uh, which is, uh, as also, again, Christian, Christian, I could hire you at the consumer organization with your speech of this morning, would be a good <laughs> recruitment interview. Uh, in fact, it's about investing into energy efficiency. The lower you need, uh, the, the less energy you need to consume, the less your energy bill uh, is going to cost you. And that, that is even, uh, it's not only a, a clever environmental policy, it's a clever economic policy because people spend less on energy. Uh, and waste less uh, energy uh, because the, the home is less insulated. And it's a social policy because it's those people who are um, low income that uh, live in the less insulated houses, and that's also true in, in, in Spain, and mm. that spent uh, too much on their on their energy bill. So it's really, uh, the, the solution is really the no-brainer is the energy efficiency. What I also would like to say, it has not yet been mentioned, we speak about reform of the uh, electricity market, but before reforming it, and not against being, you know, checking and evaluating, but roll it out. There are provisions in the current energy um, uh, electricity directive that would allow for more consumer flexibility. That would allow people who have solar panels uh, to uh, to um, to sell the electricity to the grid. And, and those provisions uh, have not been uh, implemented in many member states. And where they, even if they are implemented, there is not really a market for demand side flexibility. If you go out to the street and you ask a consumer. Do you have a domain side flexibility contract? They will, uh, you know, they will have a vague look in their eye. They don't even know what it means. So I think there are there is a potential there that really needs to be um, beefed up so that people can also uh, use this renewable energy in a way that is good for them because they will have lower energy prices, but can also be better for the energy grid in itself. Because if you have less demand uh, in the peak times, your energy grid is more resilient, and that should normally reduce also the cost of the network. Okay, Dries, let's let's bring you into this conversation as well. So, what are your thoughts? Is is this situation overall hurting the the uh, the image of the Green Deal or the progress of the Green Deal? Yes, thanks. Thanks for having me. I mean, it's maybe useful to take a second, a step back uh, on the energy price crisis. So, I would like to say three things basically. First of all, this is a gas price crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. It is not caused by green policies. On the contrary, if only we had done more renewables and efficiency in the past, we would be in a better place today also, and especially for the vulnerable and energy poor um, in society. Second, therefore, let's learn from it and really accelerate the renewables and efficiency and the green transition for in onwards. This is not a long-term solution. I'd like to stress that we are investing billions into the economy, into the uh, recovery right now. So we can steer this money to renewables and efficiency right now. Yeah, this is taxpayers' money. Unfortunately, that's not really what we see happening. We still see Europe locking itself into more gas infrastructure and more gas solutions. That's um, an issue. Third, I think this crisis has also shown and the exposure and the vulnerability that Europe has to global gas markets. Um, it's really an Achilles heel uh, of our economy because gas will continue to be volatile even more than in the past. 
let's not skit ourselves. Russia is playing games with us. So there's a moment that I think like it begs the question, how long do we still tolerate that? How long do we still want to subject ourselves to those kind of geopolitical games on our fossil fuel import dependency? So in that sense, it really gives the Green Deal a new mandate. Uh, it gives the Green Deal a geopolitical benefit and it gives renewables and efficiency. It lifts it up in terms of political importance. We need an emergency package on renewables and efficiency. Just take the example of the vaccination and of the corona crisis. We have rolled out a vaccination program in the last year to protect ourselves against COVID-19. We can also roll out an insulation program in one year to protect ourselves against gas prices. So I'd like to see this as maybe not a short-term solution like tomorrow, but at least a quite short-term solution towards next year. Same time next year, we can be in a much better place if we now roll out and we steer those billions of recovery money into the green transition on renewables and efficiency. Mexico, uh, since since Dries has has, uh, has quite expertly brought in the the gas issue, which is obviously a, a huge huge factor in 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 all of this uh, uh, crisis surge, however we want to call it. Um, what uh, what's the thinking on the on the commission side with the different proposals that have been floated lately uh, between uh, common uh, joint purchases of gas, the, the, the gas reserves, etc. How how much of of this is is a factor in in lowering the prices in the in the long term? Yeah, first of all, I, I would agree to a lot what I've said, in particular what Christian said also, it's not a crisis, it's a price surge. Mm -hmm. We have enough gas, we have uh, suppliers and demand, uh, demand issues globally, and the European gas market and the electricity market, but I already spoke about the electricity, and now you're asking about gas, is working well. I mean, mm -hmm. we have a very, over 10, 15 years, we have uh, uh, um, stabilized the infrastructure for gas. That's why in our new uh, 10E uh, trans-European networks for, for energy, uh, we are pleading strongly not to have in the, in the future any gas interconnection, gas uh, networks financed or uh, as part of the projects of common interest. That's another debate. But uh, we also have uh, reverse flows. We have done a lot to make that a fluid uh, gas market in Europe, uh, well connected with pipelines, with LNGs, and so on. So there are a couple of other factors linked to it, to gas. So first of all, uh, we need to decarbonize gas. It's part of our European Green Deal, and that's what we will present uh, on the 14th of December. It's the decarbonization of gas package. It's not the gas package, it's the de decarbonation uh, of gas package and hydrogen and methane emission uh, reduction. So it has different parts. And that has been foreseen since long before this price surge. So it's, it's really in line with our uh, net zero and 2030 uh, targets. Secondly, uh, when you ask uh, about what will be in, in terms of also of security of supply, to be better prepared, there we have added some, some elements which we are looking into it. First of all, gas storage. Um, because what we can see right now, uh, that we are slightly 5% lower than we are usually in beginning of winter times. So we are at roughly 70% of, of uh, filled in the gas storage and it's going down with the cold weather right now. So that is uh, uh, something we have to strengthen. And here we would really like to look at uh, solidarity and cross-border uh, and regional approach to be better prepared. So it's not only the national country and the storage, uh, because not all member states can have gas storage uh, because of geological uh, issues, so that we have a better regional approach of sharing uh, in, in terms of emergency this gas storage. And I had Yesterday, in the in the frame uh, of the Europe Energy Council, there was a second agreement to, uh, with two countries, uh, Germany and Austria, uh, to to have exactly this solidarity agreement in terms of emergency to give gas to other households in the other countries. It's only the second one. We encourage our member states to more do more of this solidarity in emergency on the gas side. And thirdly, as you mentioned, the joint uh, purchasing, which came out already, frankly, uh, many years ago as a proposal. Uh, it's possible already now under the current gas uh, market regulation, but it's voluntary. 
and we want to keep it voluntary. And we would are right now looking in, in strengthening and making maybe a bit clearer what could be uh, in such a joint gas purchasing uh, if member states want to do it. And, and frankly, the positions of member states are quite diverse here as well. But mm -hmm. we are looking right now to, to uh, means and a, and a framework, like we call it, to make this uh, possible because um, in the past it was always considered rather costly or complex. So we, we have to look at it again, uh, uh, what are the best bases to, to do it uh, on a voluntary basis. What, what would be the next steps for this? I mean, how, how soon would we have an announcement to the Commission or, or, or would this depend on, on, on more on the member states coming to agreements on their own? What's the, what's the, what's the roadmap for this? I mean, the, the, the decarbonization of gas package, where it will be uh, as part mm -hmm. of the security of supply uh, articles, will come out on the 14th of December. Okay, so we should expect something as soon as, in, as within, within two weeks, less than two weeks, yeah. really. Excellent. Yeah. If all goes well. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to raise before I turn to the, to the Q&A, because we have a lot of questions coming in, is, uh, you know, if we were, if we were playing uh, energy price surge uh, bingo, uh, we would have already hit, you know, wholesale electricity markets, we hit uh, the gas, the other the other, uh, the other issue that's, uh, that's constantly brought up, especially by, by, for example, the, the Polish, is the emissions trading system and the, and the um, supposed impact of CO2 prices on these, uh, on, on the uh, electricity prices overall. Uh, this morning, uh, the price of, uh, the price per ton of CO2 on the market hit 80 euros. That is 50 euros more than it was one year ago. Um, do you guys consider that this is a, a real uh, factor in, in, in the prices or is the, is the emissions trading system working exactly as it should? Uh, Mechtil, we can start with you and then we'll, we'll take it around. Yeah, I think it, uh, it's uh, it, it's working in the sense that uh, it was established to to give a carbon price, and uh, it started very low. And for many many years, I remember ETS was heavily criticised when it was around five to ten uh, euros per ton. Now, uh, as 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 uh, the market and and, and uh, the gas markets are so high, and and, and the reaction is partly and it's not entirely uh, on on the carbon prices it's it's a historical high yes 80 euros okay uh christian any thoughts yeah i think um when it comes to the root causes we need to be clear about the fact that that the vast majority of this uh temporary price surge is caused by gas mm -hmm. um that said so so to give proportions we're talking about a fifth of the price increase uh being attributable to uh to the carbon price increases mm -hmm. um so so we really shouldn't overstate uh let's say uh the role of of, of ets uh, in driving high prices um with regard to the system as it as it stands, the ETS system, um, we have to say that those price levels are basically making a difference in the market. They can basically shift, uh, let's say, the, uh, the the price priority between uh, coal plants and gas, uh, which is what the system is intended for, namely to reduce emissions. Um, on the political side of this, I would say that that we have to. Be careful. Uh, we've talked about the the reactions that we see from member states, from from uh, from populations to some extent. Um, we need to make sure that this system uh, continues to provide a very clear signal to the market, to investors. Um, but I would also um, monitor, uh, suggest that that is monitored how how high these prices go and uh, and how the uh, the so-called MSR, so the central bank for um, for the ETS system is is um, adjusted as part of this package, so that we don't come into a situation where all of a sudden, while gas prices are extremely high, we also get some uh, extreme uh, peaks on on the on the ETS price because then there might be a pushback against the green agenda that we don't need. We need everybody to be aligned about the key importance of Europe moving forward toward decarbonization. You know, Christian, it's interesting that you mentioned that because we, we, one of the questions that we have is from Giuseppe Costanza, Costanzo with the Climate Action Network, uh, Climate Action Network Europe, and he uh, writes in to say, some warn failure of EU member states to reach renewable energy capacity pledged in national energy and climate plans would significantly increase EU ETS prices to up to 200 uh, euros per ton of CO2 by 2027. 
how is the how is, his question is how is the commission preparing for this? But uh, do you do you do you see that as a as a as a real concern? Is it as something that we need to already start preparing for? I see um, I see the problem to the extent that we absolutely need to remove all barriers to renewable deployment. This mm -hmm. is the next key frontier for all this to succeed. Remove the bottlenecks. The permitting times need to be shorter. Anything that's in the way of renewable deployment needs to be dealt with here and now. Otherwise, there is indeed the chance that that um, that we we see additional impacts, uh, for instance, on the ETS price, uh, potentially also on the power price. Jeez, I, I I assume you you agree with Christian's stance on this that that uh, that we need to make it as as easy as possible and as and as uh, streamlined as possible to keep uh, moving forward with renewable deployment. I fully agree with that. I mean, I think it's important to realize that high carbon prices are also an indication of a problem. Yeah, we're not decarbonizing fast enough. So in that sense, it should react and and at some point stabilize, and it can start hurting uh, the economy and and, and the industry. Uh, if, if it continues to rise. So again, we have so many different problems in terms of prices, in terms of climate change, and we have one big answer, which is renewables and efficiency. We should really focus on that because it can solve the multiple crisis situation that we're in right now. And, and maybe if I can just take the opportunity to come back to what Mechtilt was saying before uh, about the, the gas package, the gas decarbonization package. I mean, it, this, it, it almost feels like a simplistic logic, like we're decarbonizing electricity, now we're decarbonizing gas. It's, it's not, that's not how it works, and the commission knows that. It's a system integration. But we, we don't need a gas decarbonization package. We need a heat electrification package. That's what we need. Mechthild, any response to that? No, I think it's integrated part of what everything else we are doing. I mean, uh, we already put, uh, had 12 or 13 legislative proposal in July, and now we are coming up with also, by the way, with the building performance of buildings directive mm -hmm. revision uh, on the 14th. Though you have to see it as a package. Of course, we want to accelerate renewables. And I agree that permitting is one of the key, key obstacles uh, for further deployment and accelerating renewables. I hear that all the time, and we are coming out with some guidance uh, uh, next year on, on what we see uh, as obstacles on solutions, best practice for member states uh, on to overcome uh, the permitting issues. But already the current renewables directive and even more the, the revision, which we are just now discussing, uh, has a lot of elements uh, to, to do more. And that's now uh, in the hands of the member states as well uh, to explore explore it or to implement the current and be very ambitious in in the current in the revision of the renewables directive including on accelerating and uh, and uh, decreasing uh, the bottlenecks on permitting so the decarbonization of gas package as we have gas right now in nearly all member states certainly in the heating sector and in other sectors uh, is in line with further uh, electrification where we can, renewables, energy efficiency, and going uh, uh, in, in, in low carbon gases, in hydrogen, which is also an energy carrier, which can be used uh, primarily in energy intensive or in, in long distance transport. So it's really as part of, of, of the solution and, and of the accelerating the European Green Deal. I assume part of this will also be uh, depending on, on keeping member states serious about it, as, as, as we saw with the Slovenian presidency's progress report on the uh, Renewable Energy Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive yesterday. A lot of member states are already asking for flexibility, which leads to fears that uh, there is a push to weaken these uh, these tremendous ambitions that have been rolled out by Brussels. Uh, is, is part of the key making sure that capitals remain committed to these to these goals? Mechtil? Ah, sorry. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, yesterday in the Energy Council, it was very interesting that there was huge support on the toolbox. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, we already discussed what, what to do on the electricity market design or not. But, I mean, on the short-term measures, and I think now three-quarter of our member states have put in place social measures, targeted measures uh, to help the most vulnerable uh, in the current context. And, and secondly, in the afternoon on the renewables and energy efficiency uh, proposals, indeed, there was also full support, but also uh, 
the the strong request to look at national circumstances, right. which to to a certain understand uh, to a certain way is understandable. But obviously, if we want to have a Euro real European reply, we have set high targets in line with what it's needed to become uh, to reduce 55 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions by uh, 2030. So we have to have a European re response, and every member states have to contribute it. And I think this message on the European-wide target, on the sub-targets, and on the means, our commissioner was very, very strong on it. So we will see how it goes via, uh, under the French presidency. But I think we should keep in mind uh, where we all agree to accelerate renewables, we also have, have to look uh, at what is needed and, and implement it. And member states have to really take their responsibility also at national level to make it happen. Christian, I saw you raise your hand. Go ahead and jump in, and then we're going to turn to Monique. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say I, I have a, a slightly different perspective uh, uh, on on this issue of flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, when when countries and and uh, and and companies ask for flexibility, it's it's not to be evil. It's it's basically a matter of of um, of the energy systems in different places in Europe being quite different, and. There is a risk with all the sub-targets uh, in the Renewable Energy Directive, as it has been uh, put forward, that, that we get some complexity that's going to be very difficult to handle, very difficult to implement for, for, for some member states. And, and there is a risk that, that um, we, we basically get administrative burdens to a level that, that, uh, that are not uh, you know, helpful. So when these uh, when this issue of flexibility comes up uh, it's it's really not to be counterproductive it's 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 really about how do we make this happen and again it's a bit about do we solve all this with targets uh, and micromanagement or do we solve it with markets uh, and and that balance needs to be struck nobody's saying it's either or we mm -hmm. all agree that we need a, a combination of measures but but we need to strike the right balance and um, there is a concern in our industry that that the that the uh, uh, definition of of sub targets leads to complexity and micromanagement to, to a level that's not going to be helpful for this to happen Okay. Uh, Monique, I want to turn to you because I saw you raising your hand earlier when we were talking about renovations. We also have a question from Adrian Joyce uh, that writes, significantly reducing actual energy demand is the best buffer to energy price hikes. Does the panel agree that increased action to uh, increase deep renovations in our buildings is crucial to ease the cost burden on consumers? Monique? Well, I'm not the panel, but I certainly totally agree with that. And, uh, and I agree also with everything that has been said just before about uh, all these barriers about permitting administrative burdens. But what I would like to stress is that whatever policy you roll out, at the end of the day, it will be the people who will have to make the change. They will need, they are being told that they need to switch to electric cars. They are being told that they need to renovate their houses. They are being told that the best solution for them uh, in terms of heating is electrification, is turning to electric heat pumps. And that's something that we have been confirmed. So that means that um, beyond uh, uh, alleviating all the administ administrative hurdles or, you know, uh, in terms of um, regulations, um, it's also important to de develop strong financial support. But beyond that, it's, it's fiscal policies, it's creating a market for green, green loans, for example, or green innovative business models. It's not necessarily a loan. It's not like pay as you save. Uh, models like some banks are rolling it out. It's also providing people support because many people have the finances to move to other uh, sources uh, to, to renovate their house, but it's a hassle. It's a headache. You don't know who to turn to, who is a reliable advisor, who is a trustworthy um, uh, and skilled uh, workforce who's coming to make the changes. So what we are asking for is make, because there is a feeling of overwhelming, being overwhelmed by the challenges that I as a consumer need to overcome in order to contribute to the energy transition. So what we say, help the people, assist them. And what we are asking uh, for is, a, for example, a one-stop shop uh, where uh, they can turn to and where there is a smooth journey together with them in order to help them provide the solutions that are tailor-made for their needs and for their uh, means and that can uh, then accelerate the transition. It's not only financial, it can be uh, just giving them the advice that they need for the house that they need. And one thing I, do, I would really like to insist on mm -hmm. is that stay away from hydrogen in housing. 
because there is a lot of hype around uh, you know hydrogen uh, blending hydrogen into the into, into the into the into the network hydrogen has certainly its place in the in the overall energy mix but it will never be a cost efficient option for uh, heating house uh, homes so we really believe that it's very important that uh, the whole uh, like in, in the upcoming gas package there is no targets uh, being set for member states to um, uh, in the in, in the context of hydrogen Dries, your thoughts um, more than my thoughts, Monique, yeah, I, I think it's really worth having a look at that study from, from the that, that was uh, launched um, just last week, because uh, it's, it's I think, the first time that we have such an, um, uh, a good overview of the different solutions from a consumer perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so that's indeed um, linking back to what I wanted to mention as well. We do see it's a leaked document. I know we cannot comment on it officially, but we all saw it. We do see now proposals from the Commission coming up with hydrogen blending targets into the gas grids. This is relevant for this conversation because it's not going to help energy prices for households going down, quite the opposite. Hydrogen in heating for buildings will exacerbate energy poverty. So I wonder why this is on the table when every independent study comes to that same conclusion. Um, I hear it has to do with internal energy markets, keeping things stable, but then I have the feeling that we're that the commission is confusing priorities. Yeah? The, the internal energy market is a means to an end. We need to help consumers to drive and to be part of the net zero agenda. And there's no place for hydrogen in the building sector. Christian Mechtild, any, any comments uh, in relation to that? Christian first. Mechtild, do you want to go first? Uh, I can react. I think uh, I, I agree that we have to focus on consumers. I think the Commission has been always very, very clear. And 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 one thing is that we we have uh, what we have already in the energy efficiency, in the electricity, and in our regulation. I also agree we need finance. And one good news here is that, for example, in the recovery uh, and resilience plans uh, from our member states and what we see uh, because we said we need a priority on energy efficiency and renewables roughly 38 percent of those which we have assessed are spending their money uh, 30 80 percent of their money in in short-term energy efficiency and renewables related uh, uh, projects at national level or regional level or local level so there is money from the recovery plans. I mean, there's other regional funds and, and other funds. Um, but I, I think that is something which member states are using and we are monitoring uh, that very closely. Uh, on hydrogen, I think it's really for us an energy carrier where you, in areas where you cannot electrify and where there is uh, for the time being a need to, to put hydrogen, obviously our clear aim is renewable hydrogen, uh, and we have a definition in our renewables directive. And as renewable hydrogen for the very time being is costly, we need to accelerate and make uh, economies of scale. And we have a lot of uh, research and innovation, which is also a key part of our European Green Deal. And what we want to achieve in our uh, package, which comes on the 14th of December, to create the right market incentives for hydrogen. And just to be also very clear, for as the main sectors for hydrogen in the future is energy intensive industry and the long distance transport. And then it's up to the member states uh, uh, if they have, uh, they have a lot of hydrogen strategies also at the national level. We have our EU hydrogen uh, strategy where we really want to focus on renewable hydrogen in the sectors I mentioned. Christian? I think it's worthwhile to pick up on this, you know, um, we can electrify heating systems. So so I, I do think that, that there is a real consideration that should be given to where you use that hydrogen. Uh, some people have said, coming back to the food metaphors or the, the, the beverage metaphors, perhaps, that, that hydrogen is the champagne of the energy transition. And, and if you start blending champagne in, in with beer or whatever else, uh, you could imagine uh, as, a, as a metaphor for, for natural gas. You you get a funny product, um, I think, I think and, and 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 you know this is an image. But I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll Clearly, you, there are a lot I'll of food metaphors sort of flying around. I'll give you a technical sort of illustration of of, of what is at play here. Um, when you blend, let's say, up to twenty percent uh, hydrogen into natural gas, 
you need to burn more of it to get the same energy effect because the energy density of hydrogen is lower. So you blend in 20%, but you need to, uh, and, and that could then theoretically be decarbonized, but then you need to burn 40, 14% more of that. So, so the, the savings uh, are very limited. And, and the other key dimension here is that, um, that industry wants the real deal. They want clean, uh, they want a clean product. They want to have certified hydrogen and there'll be a huge demand for, for that hydrogen, for fertilizer, for uh, refinery, uh, let's say operations and, and many other purposes as feedstocks and in industrial processes. So I think there'll be competition for this valuable product. Uh, and, um, and I wonder whether heating uh, homes will be able to compete on the price here. But let's also say there are different ways of doing things in different member states. So, so this might be an option in one or two member states. I do have my doubts, however. Okay. Uh, Mechthild, I want to turn back to you just very quickly. We have a question here from Ellen Weil at Apex Spot. Uh, and she uh, she writes in, the formation of wholesale electricity prices happens at an EU level, whereas energy mix choices are national. Does there need to be more political coordination? And how do we make that happen? Thank you. I mean, obviously, that is right. Uh, we have uh, the electricity market, the wholesale market at, at European level, but the national mix or the mix for energy sources will remain at member states level. And, and they are very different hmm. uh, traditionally, historically. And But we have achieved a lot with the electricity single market, with the gas markets, with coordination groups. Uh, we have oil coordination from the past, gas coordination, electricity. By the way, the gas coordination uh, group is meeting even uh, more regular uh, right now to really monitor where we are uh, throughout the winter. Uh, we have very explicitly uh, and, and strong contacts with all our member states on that particular question. We have different fora. So I think uh, it goes hand in hand. In a way, we, we, we have a European, a lot of European coordination markets which are functioning well. We had never had any blackouts uh, like in other. We have a strongest infrastructure compared to other regions, including the US or, or other parts of the world. So I think we are well uh, covered. It doesn't mean that we can always improve. And that's why we are looking right now into the issue to be better prepared for any uh, uh, price uh, sparks, which we are reading now, and there, this will be part of our package. But I, I would agree, I think there is uh, member states' differences, and there's no intention from us to intervene in, in the choice of any uh, energy mix uh, of the member states. Thank you. Okay, we're almost out of time. I want to end with a last question because one of the one of the recurring uh, topics that has come up through this discussion is the importance of keeping the consumer in mind. Given the the amount of uh, panic that we've definitely seen in in certain parts of the block over uh, this this precise issue, and given that we're facing a winter where consumers will be most likely exposed to these prices moving forward. Uh, if I can ask each of you very, very briefly, if you were speaking with a consumer directly, what would be your message to them, especially a consumer dealing with those especially high prices that they're going to they're going to struggle to to pay in terms of electricity bills? What would be your message uh, to to them in particular, if you if you had the the opportunity to speak to them directly? Mechtil, can we start with you? <laughs> um, difficult question. Maybe uh, let me think about it. Turn to Monik first. I. Uh... We'll come back to it. Okay, Christian. Well, I would say um, it, it depends a bit. You know, we're using the consumer. As I said before, consumers are very different. If I'm talking to my good friend who has a wife and two children, and they have two incomes and, and a car and a house, I would say but no, no. Yeah, let's let's not, not do that because you, you you mentioned before that that those those people would be able to to you know put their incomes together. Let's think, uh, you know, a low-income consumer in, in Greece or in Italy or in Spain. What, what would you say to them? I would say um, I hope your government looks out for you and, and, and make sure that the additional uh, money they have collected as, uh, as taxes because of, of rising prices, that they're going to you. Uh, because uh, if you're a single, if you're an elderly or, or in any other way vulnerable, um, then I think social measures should be considered, but that they should not interfere with the market and, and derail, uh, let's say, uh, the, the transition and, and rattle, rattle markets and, and investor confidence. Okay. Dries? 
Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a whole uh, menu of options for short-term relief for those who are mostly impacted. And that's, of course, a serious, a serious issue and a serious part of society. So I would also say, like, look at switching from supplier. I think that's always worthwhile. I've done it myself and I've really <laughs> saved <laughs> quite a lot of, so that's that's really wor worthwhile doing as well. And otherwise, yeah, uh, I would bring some Spanish ham and some beer and uh, to make it as cozy as possible. <laughs> Monique? Well, yes, uh, I mean, I agree. I would uh, say, I would also tell them if where possible, try to be vocal about it, try to express your panic uh, so that to, to put, maybe not directly, but via social workers, for example, or via your local authorities in order for the government to be put more and more under pressure to take action where it's needed. And Mechtilt? Yeah, I think uh, it's a social matter more yeah. than anything else. So I think talking to your government is something. Uh, uh, and as we said before, the, the energy and electricity uh, we need to accelerate, uh, that is probably not helping the consumer in Greece or in Spain or in Italy uh, facing the bill, but it will help him or her in the long run. But I think in a very short term, be vocal and address uh, your government and switch, if you can, uh, to another uh, competitor. I think that is possible nearly in all member states relatively easily, but we are also looking into that in our special group and we are uh, accelerating that where it's not happening right now so that consumers can switch more easily. Okay, Monique, extremely quickly. Yeah, I mean, just to be uh, attentive, uh, switching in, ter uh, in times of uh, energy price volatility can be also dangerous. So they need to monitor uh, every week or every month uh, the, the evolution of the prices of their provider. So they need really to be looking very closely to what's to happening. To make a really informed choice. Right. <laughs> Christian, <laughs> but last, last one, because I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, just very quickly, um, yeah. you should also ask your government to take this opportunity to lower taxes and levies on electricity. It's 40% of the bill that normal people pay. This is really the time to lower that uh, tax so that we also get an incentive to electrify. Okay, so it seems like we, we have a consensus there. The, uh, the, the pressure points should be put on the national governments to respond to the needs of the consumers. Um, that's all the time we have for today, so we're, we'll, we'll have to move on. Before we, we close, I want to give you guys the results of our poll. So to uh, remind you, the question was, what is the most effective action the European Commission can take to tackle the current energy price surge? And let me see if I can see the results. Okay, I'm seeing that the uh, most voted question or the most voted response was create additional schemes to protect vulnerable consumers and fund new renewable energy projects. So we're, we're seeing it up there on the Slido. Um, great. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank all of our panelists for this really, really fascinating discussion. Uh, Dries, Monique, uh, Mechtild, Christian, thank you so much for being here. And I also want to thank our partner, Enel, for making this virtual event possible. Uh, please send your feedback to live at politico.eu and check our website for event updates. We have a great related events lineup for the rest of the winter. That's at www.politico.eu slash events. Right. Uh, from Political Europe, I'm Aitor Hernandez Morales. Thank you so much and have a very nice day.